Hi, my name is Colleen Alice, and I'm here with my History Detectives 2024 presentation, The Legacy of Captain Charles E. Belknap, 100 Years After the Yesterdays of Grand Rapids. If you are a Grand Rapidian, you've probably heard of Charles Belknap. Maybe you've seen his bronze statue that's in the Medical Mile just north of downtown, or you've been to the Belknap neighborhood or you've seen the mural near the downtown area that has his name on it, um, that big mural. So most likely it's a name you're familiar with. My goal with this presentation is to round Charles out as just as a person and also as a, uh, as a figure important to the local history of Grand Rapids, um, talking about his life, some of the really significant highlights of his life, which I think was quite incredible in and of itself, and to think about the ways that his life uh, has given way to his legacy, what he leaves us behind today, both as a writer and, his, and a historian, and uh, the way that we see his fingerprints kind of still in Grand Rapids today. So my hope is that this is a timely uh, opportunity to think about Charles Belknap. It's uh, officially 100 years after his book, which is quite popular among local historians. I know um, the Yesterdays of Grand Rapids, which was published in 1922. And we're also kind of approaching 100 years after his passing. Charles Belknap lived from 1846 to 1929. So he lived quite, quite a long life. He died at age 82. And although he was not born in Grand Rapids, uh, he was actually born in New York. He moved here as a boy uh, at eight years old. And so he lived kind of the rest of his life in Grand Rapids He's buried in Grand Rapids in Greenwood Cemetery. So I I want to say that Grand Rapids can kind of claim uh, Charles Belknap uh, as a as a person important to the to the city and the early life of the city. I'd also like to note that a lot of this information, as well as some of the images I'll show you, are forthcoming in an article about Charles that is slated for publication in the spring of 2024. Uh, with the Michigan Historical Review. So if this is of interest to you, I encourage you to check that out. This is how I met Charles Belknap. I was a library assistant, new to the Grand Rapids Public Library local history floor, the fourth floor, which is now the Grand Rapids History Center. And like Charles, I am not from Grand Rapids. I'm from Michigan, but I'm from another part of the state. So I had a lot to learn about the history of Grand Rapids, and as I was trying to orient myself in order to help patrons, I was consulting, you know, uh, Baxter's history is really long and intimidating, and there are a number of resources that are great, but kind of overwhelming when you pick them up. And then there's this slim little volume called The Yesterdays of Grand Rapids, and it's, comp it's comprised of 101 columns that were originally printed in the Grand Rapids Press. And these columns, unlike some of those other sources, they are really short vignettes, really fun to read, really accessible. Um, and so I kind of started with Charles's, Charles's memories. He writes about the early history of the city, really engaging topics like, um, you know, the first police, the first jail, the early uh, the first street lights, the early police wagons, kind of these these topics that are really fun uh, and engaging. So the book stood out to me for those reasons. But it was published in 1922 by Dean Hicks, and it is freely available. Uh, the University of Michigan has it fully digitized and searchable online, so you can access it for free from the internet. And Schuler Books, one thing they've done recently is with their chat book press, they've started to print public domain local history titles, which I think is really cool because for the price of a, a paperback, um, I'm not sure the exact price, but for kind of a more modest sum, you can pick up uh, a book like this. This one's available through Schuler Books um, if you want to, if you want to own it. This is the press release that the Grand Rapids Press put out when the book came out. And what I like about it is right away, there's recognition that this is quaint and intimate articles, and that they are of historic value. Charles wrote many of these columns late in his life, in his 70s, and I think he wrote them as a man, you know, kind of at the end of his life, really reflecting and wanted to impart his memories to, you know, to readers who were curious about the early life of the city. 
So the book was published December 19th, 1922, right before Christmas, which I don't, I don't think is an accident. Um, and it was, it was for sale at that time. I also have this slide up to remind me to mention that the two collections in the Grand Rapids History Center I consulted most heavily are Collection 300, which is the Captain Charles E. Belknap collection. I think it's five boxes, maybe six, but it's filled with his unpublished manuscripts, a number of scrapbooks containing photographs, and first editions of his writings, which is just a really engaging collection. And then Collection 488, which is from Dr. Bajima, uh, newspaper clippings, uh, mostly about his political life, which I'll talk about, but was really helpful in kind of trying to piece together that part of part of Charles' life. So again, if you're interested, just some places to do further reading. So to back up and kind of start at the beginning, um, I, this is a quote that I came across that someone said about Charles. Walter McPeak said, he lived a dozen lives and he lived them to the hilt. And when I saw that quote, I thought that that's that's it in a nutshell. Charles lived a dozen lives, and I think you'll see that uh, today. The other thing I wanted to do early on was share some of his writing as a primary source so you could kind of see his voice, and we can let his voice uh, speak here. So he writes, these are both from the Yesterdays of Grand Rapids. He writes, I was a river boy. My knees were calloused where I knelt for paddling, but my trousers were never patched on the seat. Boyhood's paradise is the out of doors. It is in the dusk and dawn, the twilight and noons, where the dune land meets the glittering moon sailing on the white cap crests. So I think just really, really lovely. As I mentioned, the Belknap family came from New York. He was born in Messina, New York, October 17th, 1846. The city that he was born in is really near the confluence of the St. Lawrence River, which I only mentioned because, as you saw from that quote too, he loved he loved water, he loved the river, he was like this, he called himself a river boy. I think that was always an important part of his identity as well as the outdoors. Like many families from, uh, from Michigan, the family came from New York, the reason specifically being that his grandfather, as a veteran of a war of eight, the War of 1812, located 160 acres on war script. So Charles' father, James, moved the family in 1856. Again, Charles was eight. He is the second of the Belknap children. There are 10 in total, as mentioned by his brother, H.P. Belknap's uh, 1946 obituary. So I looked at census records and just the children kept accumulating. I can't imagine, um, but he was the second of 10 for James and Marianne. So maybe is that one reason he was largely unsupervised as a boy? I, I wonder. Um, this is just a few snippets of his very adventurous boyhood. These are all things he writes about in the yesterdays of Grand Rapids, all these anecdotes and the ways that he kept himself busy. So, for example, he took advantage of the fact that the Bridge Street Bridge burned down in the 1850s and he would ferry people across the Grand River of course, the river that runs through the middle of Grand Rapids, and he writes that the Native Americans in the area called him Canoe Boy. Uh, similarly, he uh, worked as a cabin boy one summer on a steamer when he was just about 12 or 13. He was a water boy. He delivered the paper, and he writes that he slept in the office in order to be ready when the paper was when the paper was ready. He stood outside of Squire's Opera House. Uh, at age 12, distributing handbills for a rate of 50 cents a day. So all these things kind of, for me, build a picture of just this adventurous, industrious kind of person. Um, and I think we see that bear out in Charles' life uh, very clearly. He dropped out of school at around age 14, which I note as well, because, uh, you know, I think about for someone, um, although that might have that might not have been uncommon in the time period. I think about for someone with not a great deal of formal education. Um, he, again, I just think he's a beautiful and talented writer and that just really impresses on, on me a lot. So the Civil War, um, I don't know if Charles dropped out to join the Civil War. I know that he left school at around age 14 and I know that he tried to enlist at age 14. So um, it's quite possible, but... At any rate, I wanted to share 
a short piece from a memoir written by one of Charles Belknap's nieces, Julie Belknap Baldwin. She actually wrote two memoirs. This is from her 1979 memoir. But she writes, the Civil War came on, a terrible thing. My grandfather went, Uncle James went, and Charles very conveniently forgot just when he was born, and he also signed up to his mother's horror. He proved to be a natural-born soldier, became a petty officer in his regiment. He was in the Battle of Chickamauga at Chattanooga, and to his amazement, found himself a captain at the end of the table due to the sad fact that nearly all of the higher officers had been killed. So she's noting here, Charles, forgetting just how old he is, Uncle James, that's Charles' father, um, and she notes his really kind of speedy ascension through the ranks, uh, which was true for Charles. So again, he tried to enlist. Soon after the war began in the Michigan 8th Infantry, he was refused. James had left for the war, so Charles took over the blacksmith shop that his father was running. That blacksmith shop was at the site of the Pantland Hotel, which of course is the current site of the Amway Grand Hotel. He tried again the next fall to enlist in Company H of the 21st Michigan, September of 1862. So he was 15, close to close to 16, but he was 15 there. And that's what his niece uh, mentions, forgot just how old he was. So I'm a writer and a librarian and by no stretch of the imagination, a civil war buff. But from what I understand from reading at that time in the fall of 1862, there was widespread recognition that the war was not going to end anytime soon. Um, so I think it's notable that he he just persisted in, in enlisting and the Michigan 21st is one of the one of the more famous regiments from from Michigan. There's a book that I'll share where a lot of this information uh, kind of uh, came from and, and uh, helped me with this part of the presentation. But the 21st Michigan famously was in 32 battles and under fire 118 times. And we're lucky to have this photograph of Charles at the time of enlistment. So he's only 15 years old here uh, in collection 300 in one of his scrapbooks. So I won't go point by point through his career, but this slide shows you his fast ascension and being promoted. So again, by the time he was 18, he was a captain. And um, he when he when he mustered out in June 8, on June 8 of 1865 in Washington, D.C., he was a captain. And so this is the photograph that ran in the paper that he kept in a scrapbook. Um, he was wounded as many as 10 times. Some of his obituaries said more, some said less. Without reliable hospital records, I'm I'm not clear. But um, for all the writing that he did about the Civil War, and you'll see some of his pieces, he did not write a lot about his own personal like experience with with being wounded. I wish he had. He was more interested in writing about other people and the you know what they were up to and the landscape and things. So um, I wish he had shared more about his kind of. Like it would have been great if he had kept a diary about, you know, his exact feelings and the things that happened, but, um, but that's not the case. This is the book I mentioned. That's really excellent into the tornado of war, which is, which was written by a man named James Ginko. And that phrase into the tornado of war is a phrase that James took from Charles. Charles writes that in one of his essays that being in being swept up in this was being thrust into the tornado of war. Um, so I think it's so cool that that became the title of that book. And James has this great map of the route of the 21st Michigan for those three years from 1862 to 1865. They traveled more than 3,000 miles. And some of the significant battles that you can see include the Battle of Chickamauga, the Siege of Savannah, which is quite famous, and the Battle of Bentonville. And James writes that this map does not show an excursion of 500 miles in the fall of 1864 uh, to Decatur, Alabama, in pursuit of Confederate General Nathan B. Forrest. Uh, James also mentions that from the Michigan 21st, 1,008 men left for war in 1862, and about 160 of them were there in Detroit when it was time to disband. So that figure to me is, is staggering uh, what a low survival rate that group had, um, and, and Charles survived that. So here he is, uh, 
when he's when he's when the war is over and he's uh you know being discharged we know he's wounded at least once right because we have this photo of him favoring his shoulder the caption of the photograph mentions that the photographer suggested he take his arm out of the sling and just tuck it in his coat for the photograph um so he's 18 years old here and the caption also mentions that he was very proud of his new coat which he said he had just found time and credit to buy the life of the veterans was really important to Charles in his in his life. Um, he spent some of some of his energy later organizing reunions. So this is a photograph of the Michigan Twenty First reunion taken in nineteen twenty five, and I think this photograph is staggering. And you can see how much younger Charles looks. He's on the far right than some of these other men. By nineteen twenty, he was the youngest living group member. Some articles that I read posit that he is the youngest captain to serve in the federal armies. Um, I think that's highly likely, although I wonder, given how many young men did lie about their age, um, I wonder about that. But I, I think it's very likely that he was, and safe to say he was one of the youngest. He actually went on to serve in two more wars, which I also think is fascinating because I don't imagine there are a lot of men who served in the Civil War and then the Spanish-American War and then World War I. Uh, that must be a small pool, but those latter two wars, he served in a more administrative and, and, and consulting role. He wasn't in combat, but he still participated in those conflicts. So this is his book that he put together in 1899, so roughly 30 years after the end of the Civil War. I think there was some recognition that you know some of this stuff needed to be written down before these veterans passed away. So this book contains accounts of both Union and Confederate soldiers, which is really interesting, um, as well as photographs of the many various war monuments that were being constructed at that time, at the turn of the century. So 10,000 copies were printed in 1899, and it was Charles' belief that every man who served and their survivors should get a free copy of this book. So they quickly ran out and had to print a second edition. As a writer, I think there must be nothing more exciting than needing a second edition a year later. But uh, at any rate, um, this was part of the work that he did as the historian of the Army of the Cumberland, which is a role he had for 12 years. The book is called History of Michigan Organizations at Chattanooga, Chattanooga and Missionary Ridge. In addition, his other war writings, um, I mentioned some of his columns talk about his war service, and they do. He also wrote addresses like Bentonville, What a Bummer Knows About It, and Recollections of a Bummer, which he delivered in Washington, D.C. The sense of the word bummer, by the way, so as Charles writes it, he was often tasked to kind of scout ahead of the group, foraging and, you know, getting the lay of the land ahead of the group. I, I think that's no accident. I mean, he was such a outdoors, adventurous, industrious kind of person, um, as we see with his career with the scouts as well. So when he says bummer, that's what he that's what he means. And I get the sense he was pretty proud of that moniker since since he claimed it in both titles. Other publications include Christmas Day Near Savannah in Wartime, which he published in Michigan History Magazine. So moving on, life after the war, the Civil War is over. Charles is 18 years old. He has his whole life ahead of him, and he has that nickname Captain, which follows him the rest of his life. About a year after the war ended, he marries Chloe Caswell, who is or who was the daughter of David Caswell, who was instrumental in the fire service. So I, I think that's no accident too. Um, Charles, as I'll show you a photo in a minute, uh, spent time with the early city firemen. His dad was involved with the fire service. So in whatever way that he met Chloe, he married her after the Civil War uh, in 1866. They went on to have four daughters together, Bertha, Helen, Jane, and Grace. Right after this time, he had his blacksmith shop on the west side of the Grand River on Bridge Street, but he actually closed it and tried his hand at farming and other odd jobs in Sparta, Michigan. Um, 
that doesn't last too long. Uh, by the early 1870s in the city directories, we see Charles has moved back to Grand Rapids and he's on Turner Street on the west side. Um, and he starts to get involved in, in some other things. But I'm curious about these years. Um, there's not much there's not much that I know about these years. I just have a picture of him maybe enjoying some peace and quiet uh, with Chloe and, and having their daughters and after the Civil War and maybe looking for some peace after that. At any rate, he gets involved in the fire service. Uh, he began serving in 1870, the number three company. Uh, in that day, early firemen were not only unpaid, but fined if they missed a fire, which is pretty mind boggling. So he was among those who advocated for better organization and pay. Just like his military career, he ascended the ranks. He became ultimately the assistant fire chief. He did that for about 10 years until his retirement. He writes in his yesterday's columns about his Kentucky mayor fly quite a bit. Um, one thing we can say for sure is that Charles really loved horses. He was always writing about fly. In his unpublished Civil War manuscripts, he writes about Dan. And the first time I read one of his columns, I thought Dan was a, a man or a fellow soldier. And then there's a passage where he rubs his nuzzle. And I thought, no, no, Dan, Dan is the horse. So he has about three essays about his horse. As I mentioned, here's Charles hanging out with the Wolverine Company 3. So this photograph has Charles in, in red at the far left holding a trumpet. So this is pre-Civil War. This is when Charlie was just a boy. Um, so you can kind of get that, that sense of him as part of his love of adventure. Around this time too, 1871, he opens his business. He uh, founded the Belknap Wagon and Sleigh Company, which as I understand it was quite successful and long running. It was ultimately dissolved in the 1920s. Um, but the wagons that he made were often used for logging purposes, which is probably which probably speaks to why they were so successful in Michigan and shipped to other states. In the later years of the company, they were shipped internationally as far away as Honduras, South Africa, and other places. Um, the company was often profiled in the Michigan tradesmen, so it, it just was was pretty successful. You know, as I mentioned, it began in 1871. It had doubled by 1874, and then by 1887, he needed a bigger operation, so he had a four-story fireproof brick factory at the corner of front and first streets. So this is cool to see those very early Sanborn fire insurance maps that I know the library just acquired in the last 10 years or so, but um, there aren't many businesses on this 1878 map. So it's so cool to see the CE wagon shop on the west side of the river in that pink square uh, with the number nine on it. That's where, that's where he set up his operation. And then as though the man weren't busy enough with, with all of that, and I think about Chloe and having four young daughters at home, he decides to break into a political life. So he became alderman of the Seventh Ward in 1878, or excuse me, 1874. At that time, the city had 12 wards. So he was alderman of the Seventh Ward. Then he became mayor. He was mayor in 1884. I have a great mayoral portrait to show you of that time. Uh, he did run again to be mayor for a, a second term, but he lost that election, and then he contested the loss. And what's notable there is that's not the only time he contested an election, as you'll see, because later he ran for Congress. He was congressman to Michigan's 5th Congressional, from Mich Michigan's 5th Congressional District to the 51st Congress from 1888 to 1891. He turned down uh, the option to run again as a Republican but then the person who won, Melbourne H. Ford, died several weeks into office. Charles did wind up serving that 1891 to 1893 term. Then he decided to run again. He lost the 1892 election and he contested it and then he lost that. So um, just as I'm not a Civil War buff, I'm also not a very skilled political analyst, um, although the Badgema, the Badgema articles are helpful with this. I wonder if his attention was just divided uh, between his business or, I don't know, the the arduous journey of traveling to D.C. in those days. I'm not sure, but um, he seems at the very least a little bit divided in his political life. 
I know that veterans issues were really important to him. He was constantly advocating for the veterans and their pensions. And um, I also get the impression that he was against like bars and saloons and was, he had support from the women's Christian temperance organization. Um, so he was in favor of kind of the nightlife of the city, uh, which I mentioned because former city historian Gordon Olson told me there is a recipe for beer in collection 300. And indeed there is. Uh, and here it is. It also shows you kind of his handwriting, uh, which is really, uh, which is really distinctive. But um, I think it's really cool that even if he wasn't a big uh, drinker, he still has a connection to Beer City and Grand Rapids is proud of its brewing history. And Gordon told me he made this beer and Gordon said it, it was pretty good. So <laughs> that's great. Here's that mayoral uh, portrait I mentioned. All of the early photos I showed you of Charles, he has no facial hair because he's so young, but later in his life, he had a very trademark distinctive handlebar mustache, which you can see that the newspapers, you know, make caricatures of as, as they do. So that's a lot about his life, which again, that phrase, he lived a dozen lives and he lived them to the hilt, I think is, is really apt. And born out of that life is the legacy that he leaves behind as a writer and, a, and as a historian, as well as how we see him around the city of Grand Rapids today. So here's one of his Yesterdays of Grand Rapids columns as it originally appeared in the Grand Rapids press. Uh, and as you can see from the date, this is December 30th, 1922. So this was published after the Dean Hicks edition. The Dean Hicks books, book has 101 columns. And then after it was published, Charles kept writing. He wrote, by my count, an additional 50 columns. So he decided he had more to say and more topics to cover. Uh, so it's one idea or dream of mine that someday we could kind of collate all 150 plus columns and put them all together for a full picture. This is a selection from one of his unpublished manuscripts that lives in collection 300. So you can also see his handwriting. And again, for someone who left school at age 14, uh, I just find him to be a pretty impressive writer and have a really great command of language. This is one of his Civil War recollections it's titled Dan in the Carolinas. So again, involves his horse. Oh, which uh, famously, I, sh I wanted to mention, there's an article in the paper about how General Ulysses S. Grant liked Dan, and Charles had to very reluctantly loan his horse to Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, and he wasn't very happy about that, but, um, but he did loan his horse to Ulysses S. Grant. So his legacy around the city, this is the statue that lives in the medical mile, um, almost 13 feet tall, almost 12,000 pounds bronze statue with a, with a bench that says, do a good turn daily, which is of course the scout motto. And he's dressed in the statue in his scout uniform. The first home of this statue was in Baldwin Park near Lake Drive and Fuller. It was there for a number of years and then moved to Belknap Park for a number of years. Fairly recently, in 2017, it was moved to its third and current location. So now he kind of sits at the base of the of the medical medical mile. There was recognition really soon after he passed away in 1929. He died in January of 1929 of, of stomach cancer. And there was really immediate recognition that the city wanted to do something uh, in order to honor his legacy. So he's in the medical mile uh, area uh, by Belknap uh, Lookout, which of course is a neighborhood in Grand Rapids. Here are those early campaigns I mentioned, uh, the scouts raising money. So we have this great photo on the right of the Girl Scouts and the one on the left depicting the city manager at the time and the mayor at that time seated with two young men. And you can see the poster behind them is, is discussing the memorial. Here's the mural that I mentioned uh, that overlooks the expressway, and it features also, of course, Louis Campo and Sophie. So I think when we think about the really early figures in Grand Rapids, we think about Louis and uh, Ricks Robinson as well. And Charles was just a little bit later, but as a boy, 
he actually spent time with Louis Campbell and Rex Robinson, and he writes about them and what they were like, which is which is just fascinating. Um, so so kind of cements his his role in the city too. And this mural depicts a steamboat. And also Charles had a steamboat named after him, as I learned in my research, a steamboat on on Reed's Lake. So this is from 1887. The Belknap steamer ultimately met its demise with fire, as so many things did in the early history of the city. I don't know if Charles Belknap ever wrote on this, but it's possible because he was in Grand Rapids at this time. Uh, so I, I like to think he he wrote on it. And we know that in his later years of his life, he focused on his writing and he focused on speaking engagements. He was always speaking to different groups about the Civil War or the history of the city. He was really involved with the uh, old residents organization too at that time. So I know he spoke at Ramona Park. So, so it's all very possible. Among the other tributes in Collection 300, uh, the picture on the right is a song someone wrote about Charles Belknap, four verses. I will not sing it, but the lyrics are talking about hurrah, hurrah, Charles Belknap. Uh, standing beside the forge and talking about him, um, you know, as a blacksmith and and just in Congress and all of his accomplishments. So I think it's pretty incredible that a song, someone wrote a song in tribute to him. The image on the left was something that was printed in the Grand Rapids Herald, How to Keep Young. And uh, Charles, this is from Charles, rise at 6 a.m., hurry to the office, direct the day's activities, goes on and on with everything he does, 12 to 15 hour work day. Um, this is not the daily program of a man of 35 years old, the paper writes, but of Captain Charles E. Belknap, now 72, still recognized as able-bodied by Uncle Sam. So he just was industrious his whole life. He kind of never slowed down. Um, Chloe, his wife, passed away in 1902, by the way. So he kind of lived the last two and a half decades of his life alone, although at various points his daughters would live with him. He lived for a long time in a home on Madison Avenue, and later in his life he lived on a home on Benjamin, which is where he was living when he passed away in 1929. So again, he never slowed down. Here he is marshalling a parade. Again, the, the lives of veterans was so important to him, so this is a Memorial Day parade, and of course he's riding a horse. And out in nature, as this photograph is captioned, a good scout in his handwriting, uh, he he never passed up the opportunity to be outdoors, and he had a really instrumental role with the young scouts, as you can see too here from this picture. When he had his 80th birthday, the scouts threw him a party. It's well documented in the paper, and he delivered an address to the Campfire Girls. Uh, these are the last few years of his life, uh, 1926. And he said to them, so let me but live my life from year to year, not hurrying for the trail's end, not mourning for the days that have passed, but with a happy heart that pays its toll to the youth and to age as well. So I'll close today with my favorite picture of Charles Belknap, a later in life image of him uh, held by the Grand Rapids Public Museum Archives. Just Charles at, a, at his desk writing, I really identify with a messy desk and papers everywhere. And um, this just really, for me, gives gives me a picture of, of who he was and um, the legacy that he leaves behind as a writer. So thank you. I have my email displayed here. If you'd like to reach out with a question, that's fine. And I'll close too with this really great photo of Charles and a pretty impressive fish. Thank you.